We're going to be talking about depreciation when valuing businesses and what Warren Buffett says on this week's video. Hey there, everyone. It's uh, David Barnett from davidcbarnett.com, the blog site, YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, Amazon, and others podcast where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses. This week, I got a great video comment from Dan Cochran, who was watching one of the videos that I made way back in 2015 called Three Ways to Evaluate the Price of a Small Business. There should be a link floating around here uh, or down below in the notes if you want to go check it out. Dan asks the following question. He says, Warren Buffett says to subtract depreciation from EBITDA to get the SDE in addition to adding back any other owner's value from general expenses. What are my thoughts? Why should a seller get paid on a multiple of an expense? Thank you. So great question, Dan. Great question. And quite frankly, um, I don't often get the chance to speak for Warren Buffett. So I'm going to right now. Um, basically what Warren Buffett, and if you don't know, Warren Buffett is the the Oracle of Omaha, you know, Berkshire Hathaway, big investor guy has made billions of dollars in money from wise investments in publicly traded companies. And so when someone like Warren Buffett is commenting about businesses, it is generally from the perspective of these large businesses. And this is something that I run into all the time because there are very few people out there who go out and get a formal education in small business and I don't know if there really is anyone teaching a formal education in small business. Most of the time when we go to school for business, we're in this world of big companies. You know, I was constantly doing case studies in my business degree about what Procter & Gamble should do or what General Electric should do or some big bank should do, et cetera. So let's break down Warren Buffett's position. He basically says that when you take an EBITDA cash flow figure, now let's, let's, let's expand that acronym. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, okay? Depreciation and amortization are two terms that kind of mean the same thing. It's basically long-lived assets in a business. How do we measure them wearing out over time? So depreciation and amortization, there's another one called depletion, which is only for certain types of companies. The, what the accountants have done over the course of the history of accounting is they figured out different ways that we can show these really expensive things like pieces of equipment or buildings and things. We can show the value lost over the course of their life. So we're talking about things that last a long time, like vehicles, things like that. And so the accountants have always had a duty to try to create financial statements to represent to shareholders what's going on in a business. Okay. And so what that means is that there's different methodologies of depreciation for different kinds of assets based on what the loss of value is. So something like a vehicle might have a declining balance depreciation. So it might drop 30% a year. So 30% of the initial figure is a big amount. And then 30% of what's left is a proportionally smaller. And as you go through time, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Whereas a straight line depreciation would take the value of something and just divide it over its life. So where would you see this in a vehicle? For example, we have declining balance. As you know, from your own vehicle, you drive it off the dealer's lot, it loses value. The loss of value is greatest in the first few years. This declining balance kind of system makes sense for vehicles. For something like uh, a new uh, built-in countertop for your little diner and you have a 10-year lease, well, that countertop is gonna last for 10 years, but we don't know what's gonna happen at the end of your lease. So that would be an instance where a straight line depreciation might be employed, simply taking the value of the counter, dividing by 10, applying that amount of depreciation every year. So when Warren Buffett looks at a big company, like, oh, well, sorry, let, let's get back to that the EBITDA thing. So um, if we look at the earnings before interest and taxes and depreciation, Warren Buffett says we're kind of in this fairyland where other people are paying for our stuff. It makes sense because every business out there has stuff, machinery, equipment, et cetera, that is going to wear out over a period of time. And the cost of that stuff is borne by the company. I mean, it's got to be paid for. And so for investors to look strictly at an EBITDA cash flow figure, they're ignoring the fact that they're going to eventually have to replace this stuff. The other two items, interest and taxes. Well, 
if you're going to leverage your acquisition, you're going to have an interest expense that's going to affect your pocketbook as an investor. And every business out there, if it makes money, is going to have some kind of tax burden. So looking at this earnings before all those four things, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So why then do people in the finance community and investment community look at this kind of number? It's because they're trying to get some sort of even keel measuring stick to look at one business versus another. Okay. And so, so when Warren Buffett says it doesn't make sense to look at that number, he's absolutely correct. It doesn't make sense to look at that kind of number because if you're looking at an oil refining company, they have huge depreciation from that big refinery. If you're looking at, you know, uh, some other kind of business that doesn't really have a lot of capital intensive stuff, more of a service oriented business, well, they don't have as much depreciation. And so you have to kind of measure these two different businesses and look at what you're really getting when you buy them. Now, let's talk about that big trucking company. So when Warren Buffett looks at a trucking company that has 500 rigs on the road, you know that there's a fleet manager somewhere in there who's buying new trucks every year and retiring trucks every year. They've got this constant turnover of their vehicles, which means that when the accountants calculate depreciation for that business, the depreciation number actually has some sort of bearing on the true loss of value of that fleet of equipment because there's the, the pool of capital items is so big and there's a turnover going on, we can look at that depreciation number and we can use it as a true measure of the value or the expense of that stuff wearing out. Now, if you are buying a small business and it has one truck, right? What depreciation number do you look at? Because if the accountant is using a declining balance depreciation, literally this year's depreciation expense could be half of what last year's was. So if you're gonna follow Warren Buffett's advice and he says to use a depreciation number, which one are you gonna use? What makes sense? As the buyer of a small business, does it even really matter to you how much value has been lost in that truck? Or is it more important for you to simply know that you're gonna be able to deliver goods to your customer. If you're enjoying the video, click the thumbs up, please. I've got more stuff here that we're getting into and you're gonna enjoy it. So click thumbs up, it really does help me. Thank you. So when we look at small businesses, not only are we looking at the EBITDA, which again, brings us squarely into the middle of fairyland where somebody else is paying our interest taxes and paying for our stuff. Not only that, we add back all of the available cash flow to the owner to get a measure of cash flow called SDE, seller's discretionary earnings, which means that not only are we, you know, for that cash flow, not only are the ferries paying for the equipment, the taxes, the interest, they're also paying the, you know, for the, the owner's time, right? So clearly this SDE number isn't related to anything that's ever going to end up in your pocket. So why on earth are we using it? It's because we need some sort of standard metric and methodology in valuing these small businesses. So we get back to this SDE number. And then when I'm talking with buyers anyway, I explain to them from this SDE number, you need to achieve several things. You need to bring home enough money to feed your family, right? Number one. Number two, you're going to have to pay your taxes. Number three, you're going to have to cover your debt service, which is more than just interest. It's also the principal portion of the payments. And you're going to have to cover any sort of capital expenditures, right? So the business might be priced on a multiple of SDE, but that doesn't mean that all that cash is going into your pocket, right? And this is one of the reasons why small business valuations tend to be such low numbers as a multiple of SDE. Because what we're doing is we're looking at what other people paid for similar businesses. And we're seeing what they paid for a multiple of SDE. And we're hoping that those people thought about things like capital expenditures and everything as well. Now, let's get back to that question about depreciation. In your small business that has one vehicle, I already asked the question, how do we know which year's depreciation to use? There's another problem that exists. So while the accountants are trying to create financial statements to reflect to the shareholders what's going on in the business. Most small businesses don't actually have financial statements that are created with that kind of level of discernment. Most small businesses that we're going to look at, you know, might only be offering you internal statements or maybe tax returns. 
here's another problem. The people over at the tax authority, they're not actually concerned about what loss of value is there. They're concerned about implementing tax policies that the politicians have told them to implement. Okay. So let me give you an example. Uh, when Donald Trump introduced a bunch of tax reforms a few years ago, one of the things that were in those reforms were more options for accelerated depreciation. Why did they do that? Well, they wanted to create an incentive for business people to invest in new plant and equipment so that the businesses that sell that stuff would have greater opportunity. And the hope was to create further jobs in the economy, right? So you could very well look at financial statements for a small business who's using accelerated depreciation and see that, you know, two years ago, they had a huge amount of depreciation. Now they have none because they've depreciated all their stuff right away in order to get a tax benefit two years ago because the government was trying to encourage them to spend money in certain ways. So that depreciation number that you find on the tax return or on the financial statements in a small business may not be trustworthy for your purposes as a business buyer. So what it really, what this means, and the, re, the reason I was originally taught why SDE, seller's discretionary earnings, was the measure that we used when we looked at small businesses is because interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization in small businesses are discretionary. It all has to do with how the owner has chosen to run the business. So if they do accelerated depreciation, they've chosen to max out depreciation earlier. If they decide to put themselves on payroll and they pay themselves a big bonus so that there's no profit left in the business, well, they're going to pay personal taxes, but now the business doesn't pay any income tax. Again, discretionary. If they're going to leave profits in the business and pay off all the debts and have no interest expense, that's their choice. If they're going to take every penny out and borrow at a higher interest lender to finance the business, interest expense is going to be higher. Again, discretionary. It's how they've chosen to run the business. So as a buyer, we need to back all those decisions out to get to a number that we can then build upon because we're going to be looking at our own financing costs. We're going to be looking at what we need as far as a wage in order to run this business. We're going to have to look at what we need for that depreciation number and when we're forward looking and trying to plan for a business acquisition, the term changes from depreciation to something called CapEx, capital expenditures. So remember the question that I had, how do we know which depreciation figure to use if we're looking at a business that owns one delivery truck? We don't care what the truck costs. All we care about is the functionality of being able to deliver goods to our customer. When we buy that business, we get the truck. When the truck starts to cost too much in the way of maintenance and repairs, we want to replace the truck. So in our cash flow forecasting, what kind of number can we use as a proxy for that depreciation expense, right? Warren Buffett uses the actual depreciation from the financial statements because he's looking at the big company. We need to figure out what is a proxy number that we can use for that one truck. And in my opinion, a lease rate is the perfect proxy for that CapEx. So you find out what kind of truck is necessary in this business. What does that truck cost? Go online. There's many different online lease payment calculators. And you say, what would it cost me to lease a truck like that? And that's the number you fit in. And this now is your CapEx expense that you take into consideration when you're making an offer on that business. I hope that you've enjoyed this. Listen, if you're serious uh, at all, Dan, about buying a small business, I highly recommend that you enroll in Business Buyer Advantage. And if you want, and you can find that at businessbuyeradvantage.com. And if you want to learn the intricacies of how you actually create a full-fledged cash flow forecast for doing an acquisition, which I highly recommend for anyone who's going to buy a business, because the, the, the CapEx and the you know considerations in a business that has one delivery truck versus a business that has you know, a factory and all, all this stuff is unique and different. I don't truly believe that you can go online and download a cash flow template from anywhere that's going to be suitable for every business. Every business has certain unique features. And so when I built my cash flow forecasting and business plan writing program, I start with a blank sheet. 
and I teach the students how to actually start from step one and build it all piece by piece over the course of, I think it's 13 weeks, a lot of videos, a lot of time. But as one recent student actually emailed me and said to me, David, I took some accounting courses last year. In the first four weeks, you've covered more than we did all year. And it, it truly is an in-depth program that will teach you from scratch how to build an accurate financial forecast that will give you a cash flow forecast, income statements, balance sheets, and allow you to put all of that into a business plan that makes sense if you're going to go talk with investors or a banker. And with that, I'll say see you later. Hit like, please subscribe. If you enjoy the content of my videos and you don't have time to watch me on YouTube, you can also find me on every podcast feed out there. I love you very much and we'll see you next time. Cheers.